active in therapy. Sometimes I've used the exercise of drawing a line on a sheet of paper. One end is your birth and one end is your death. And where are you now? shocking for people but it helps them take a look that there is a schedule and as we look back on our life what do we feel about it people have some regrets. Many people will be filled with regrets. There's so much about their life that they regret having done or not having done. Then you can get some therapeutic leverage by beginning to raise the question, well, suppose we were to meet a year from now. What could you do during this year so you'd live a regret-free life? Okay, uh, so how are you first week? Okay, I'm doing fine, thank you. Okay. It's an honor to do this interview today. When we received the positive response, uh, we had so many questions to ask, but uh, we have listed some of the questions, so we will go from topic to topic, and uh, I hope you feel good about it. Okay. Uh, in your professional journey, you have seen it necessary and you have integrated into your work as a philosophical aspects, especially from the existentialistic philosophy, uh, which the main postulate of which approach is the existential way and the confrontation with death. Uh, you even wrote in your books. So uh, I would like to ask uh, about the life. Uh, so, the question is, what is the meaning of life from your perspective? If life has any particular meaning, we can try to imbue it with meaning on an individual basis. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I've written kind of a whole book about that. It's hard, it's hard to answer that in, in a sentence or two. Um, but there, um, you know, for me, uh, what, what just is my life meaning is my is my relationship with others and with my wife and my family and my work um, um, I, th I think the person that's probably going to elaborate this most clearly is victor frankel in, in his book on, on the meaning of life it's still a bestseller after about 50 years uh so it's obviously speaking speaking to a, a lot of people but uh, but anyway, for, for me, my, my meaning is, is to work with others, to help others, to be with my family, my friends, uh, to do something outside of myself, to try to be uh, uh, gentle and helpful to other people. Okay. I think that often has to extend to others, not, not to speak in a, in a, in a, in a solipsistic and solitary way. Uh -huh. The idea of knowing oneself or curiosity about oneself is kind of a function of the kind of brain we have. I think it's inbuilt into us and we search all the time. The more that we know ourselves, the better lives we can live. And when we get into trouble, very often, it's the expression of parts of ourselves that we don't know very well.
I've been doing psychotherapy for over 50 years now. One way I think of myself is that I'm a guide on this voyage of self-exploration. And I'm a guide because I've been there before. You know, guides usually, people who've taken this trip many times, and I have. Knowing myself is an ancient concept going back uh, much further than Socrates and is at the root of much of philosophy. With that in mind, what are the most important things to learn about oneself or is uh, all self-knowledge equal? Well, for me, it's extremely important. Yeah. And I, I spent my life trying to uh, explore myself, to understand myself, uh, and to try to help others understand themselves as well. Uh, so I spend all my time thinking, working on, on that issue and, and trying to write about it and teach others how to explore oneself too. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, inward looking as, as well as reaching out to others is terribly important. Yeah. <laughs> There are unconscious forces in us. And that was what Freud introduced, that we should attempt to understand ourselves, to get our unconscious illuminated, to see what's there. He postulated that if we're not understanding ourselves well, then a lot of our baser animal instincts can be in play a lot, leading to a lot of violence and unhappy sexual expression and pursuits. Once we can understand that tends to take the fuel out of the neurotic symptoms and gradually they dissipate. One has never fully explored oneself. There's always more. We begin to look at the whole issues of how it comes to pass that he thinks there's no further area to explore. So that's an area to explore. <laughs> In your books, uh, Dr. Yavum, uh, you have wrote in the existential ways, so uh, you don't include God or uh, religion to define things such as uh, death or uh, anything. Uh, so my question is, how do you see the role of religion on uh, mental health? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm personally an atheist. Uh, I'm not a religious person. I I, uh, I, I don't believe in a God, uh, and that is, is my personal view. Yes. If I have patients who do, I will certainly honor that, respect that, and challenge them. Yes. But uh, I, 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 I don't come from a religious uh, background. Grief is more difficult with people with whom you have unfinished business. When the death comes, the conflict is frozen in time. The great majority of patients that come to see me, they fall into despair because they're not able to form an intimate, a nurturing, lengthy relationship with other people. If we don't fully understand ourselves, I think that we also may not fully understand others or appreciate others.
how important is the age of uh, the therapist to carry out on uh, psychotherapy? I don't quite know what you mean by that. I mean, therapists usually have to go through several years of schooling and, and by their mid-twenties or so, they become a therapist. And I've been doing therapy ever since that time for the last uh, uh, 70 years or so. Uh, and um, so I, I'm not sure the age makes a great deal of difference in, in the therapy. So you still do psychotherapy? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm still seeing patients, and I've got a patient waiting for me in just a few minutes. So I, I, I'm doing therapy all, all the time. I'm not, I don't do as much therapy as I did before, uh, because I'm, I'm quite old, but, uh, but I, I still do a lot of therapy now. I'm doing, I'm doing briefer therapy. Uh, for the last several years, I've told patients when I start that I will uh, only work with you for one year. And so it's a kind of uh, brief therapy, not very brief therapy, but I've been working with people only for a year. And gradually I'm, I'm beginning to stop doing therapy now at, at, at my age. But I certainly think people can do good therapy into their 80s. Yeah. Uh, we all know about the importance of empathy in psychotherapy. Yeah. yeah. But how is this? Uh, can a therapist develop it or is just something that you have or not? Oh, no, no, you can definitely develop uh, therapy. We, 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 we work on that all the time. You know, that, that's one of the things that I like very much about group therapy, because I think it's a very effective format for, for working on empathy. Uh, having people ask people, how do you think that comment makes me feel? Yeah. How do you think that comment makes this person in the group feel? Uh, could you give a guess about that? Now, would you mind telling us, in fact, the other person, how did that make you feel? So people are learning all the time. How does my comment make you feel? It's a very yes. important issue in, in group therapy. I work on it all the time. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yalom, do you think psychosis can be treated uh, without medication? Uh, I think people who are psychotic probably do need to be psycho have 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 medication. Uh, for many years, people try to work with psychotic patients with severe, uh, with working with therapy, but it, it takes many many years of therapy. And I, I think that 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 medication does have a place with psychotic patients, both with uh, psychotic depression and mania. Uh, it, you can't work with uh, a manic psychosis and, and, and psychotherapy. You need some help with medication. Uh, so I, I see people who are psychotic and in the hospital. That's for a place for medication, but not for people who have minor problems in living or how they relate to other people. Uh, with my, there, there you can work with, with, with psychotherapy. Yeah. The therapists are in therapy their entire lives. So uh, learning and changing and growing is kind of part of our lifelong education. So knowing oneself, you know, is very important. Socrates, Socrates spent a lot of time teaching that and I, I agree very much with him. now it has come in because of a lot of obsessions that he has he's got to keep checking numbers and checking figures and having magical thoughts in his mind but underneath there is a lot of rage so gradually this patient is getting into some of his angry thoughts angry thoughts about his parents that it's very very hard for him to express these He's full of fear when he talks about it. There's a lot of shame because he ought to have a great deal of respect and love for his parents. And yet, in fact, he doesn't.
There's all kinds of reasons why you can't face some of these things that are inside of you. People are ashamed. People uh, imagine what the other will think if they were to disclose something and they'd be rejected or scorned or humiliated in some way. But in therapy, people begin to learn that the kinds of things they worry about are the sort of things that everybody worries about. They're not so different. It's like welcome to the human race sort of feeling. a teenager, it was very strong with me that the best thing a person could do in their life was to write a really good novel. When I went to medical school, it was with the idea that psychiatry, that's as close as I can get to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. They were great psychologists. I thought I could use what they it could teach us about that and looking for patients. And I could begin to use my experience, perhaps in my own writing. I could see that psychiatry could be a place that I could write. And almost everything I've written since then, and all the books of stories or novels I've written, have been books that have illuminated some aspect of how psychotherapy works. I started my psychiatric residency at Johns Hopkins. At that point, it was all well, de rigueur, really, for people to have a personal analysis. I started my training right away with a Freudian analyst. For three years, about 700 hours, I lay on her couch and free associated. And she was basically, as, as analysts were, a blank screen, heavily unengaged, made only interpretations. And frankly, it was of very little use for me. Uh, I, I kept feeling all the time, this is a really bad model for psychotherapy. And uh, 700 hours is a costly way to learn that, but I, I think I learned how not to be with patients. But I remember just the dream of leaning That's forward right. and oh, yeah. brushing Your hair was hair pulled forward. forward. You were brushing your hair, you want to get your mother out of your yeah. hair. That's what it I feel like you need to be much more engaged and you need to form an authentic, genuine relationship with a patient. The therapist is both participant, I'm participating in this relation, but observer. You know, I, I think that the, the model that the therapist set for a patient, the, the intimacy, the connection, that, that gets put into the patient's mind and he uses that as a reference point, an inner reference point for how he relates to other intimate relationships in his life. I'm a surgeon. I look at facts. I, I work with facts to help other people. Now, I, I'm not a surgeon anymore. I'll never practice again. The stroke has ruined me. I, I uh, even have to learn how to walk again. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm confused. I don't even know what my body's telling me. Whether the pain that I feel is something to worry about or not. I'm... Um, 
uncertain about what's going to happen next. George, I know this hasn't been easy for you, I, but I, I feel you've shared a whole lot. I, I feel very moved by what you've said. I feel a lot closer to you. I feel like I, I kind of know exactly what you're going through. I guess so, but it's... You uh, really did that today. It sure is hard. <laughs> I um, got interested early on in, the, in my training in, in group therapy. And uh, one of my teachers was a name named Jerome Frank, who had been a pioneer in, in group therapy. And I watched him lead a group through a one-way mirror. They were very new at that point. We couldn't have been much bigger than about six inches. And all of us had our heads crammed up trying to see through that, that mirror. And then we'd meet with him afterwards. And then later, if he were out of town or somebody, he asked me to lead the group for him. So that was my first introduction to group therapy. The first paragraph of that story. Now oh, that's in the prologue. The first paragraph to the first story is is, is, a, is a, a short paragraph that I think is, I always feel is one of the best ones I've ever written. And I had a, a publisher who loved that and memorized it and would say it to all the booksellers. Uh, so the story starts off. I do not like to work with patients who are in love. Perhaps it's because of envy. I too crave enchantment. Perhaps it's because love and psychotherapy are fundamentally incompatible. The good therapist fights darkness and seeks illumination, while romantic love is sustained by mystery and crumbles upon inspection. I hate to be love's executioner. One of the great paradoxes of life is that self-awareness breeds anxiety. Fusion eradicates anxiety in a radical fashion by eliminating self-awareness. The person who's fallen in love and enters a blissful state of merger is not self-reflective. Because the questioning lonely I can dissolve in the we. Thus one sheds anxiety but loses oneself. We have to take cognizance of the fact that all of us, at some point or other, are threatened by the factors that are intrinsic to our existence. We all have to face the inevitability of death. We all have to face the dilemmas of, of freedom. We all have to face this fundamental question of what's the meaning of life. Every culture has done this since the world began. We all have to face questions about isolation. We all want to emerge and pair, uh, to submerge this lonely I into a we. You know, I think these are, these are universal. Different cultures handle it different ways, different individuals handle it each way. But the therapist has to uh, deal with those very issues for himself. I found a great many philosophers who had written about these existential concerns. So I read many, many years, and I ended up writing this textbook on existential psychotherapy. I've always tried to, to write saying, every good therapist needs to know something about these issues because they're going to be relevant for many of your patients. I could ask you just to meditate upon your own being. You just screen out everything else, your cell phones and your daily schedule. 
If you get down to the deepest layers, what will you begin to think about? What's the point of life? Death is a powerful force in the life of every single one of us, and whether we know it or not, it's having an amazing influence on how we live. And the same thing is true for the existential concern of isolation. There are some people who may never have come to terms with the existential concerns around isolation and therefore use relationships almost as a shield. It's not a caring for the other, it's using others as a shield against loneliness. Kant was the philosopher who brought this very much to my mind. There's a unique world that each of us inhabit because no one has had the exact same experiences as you have had. No matter how close we try to relate to another person, there's something, some space, that can never be bridged. Think of all the luscious feelings and smells and tastes that I had when I was young. And I think they're out there, but they're really only in my mind at all. And when I cease to exist, that world goes also. There's a certain kind of shock there, a certain kind of sadness. Self-awareness is a terrible treasure that we have. But nonetheless, I've never believed that awareness leads to madness or denial to sanity. My psychotherapeutic approach is thus epitomized by Thomas Hardy's comment. 
If a way to the better there be, it exacts a full look at the worst. I'm 80 years old now. In the 70s, all these things go wrong with your body and uh, you can't do the things you want to do and it's a time for, uh, and your memory is beginning to lapse. It's a time for the onset of some terminal despair, but it's just been the opposite with me. I feel freer and not anxious about things and I feel very creative and very excited about my work. So I just want to say to the younger people, there's there may be even better days ahead. After writing the book on existential therapy, I felt that somehow you could get at the truth of that much more with powerful narrative. I really sort of turned over another chapter in my life and I thought, I'm going to be a much better teacher as a storyteller. I started the novel when Nietzsche wept. I have two characters that are Nietzsche and Joseph Breuer. Each of them had a love obsession with the woman. Breuer in that book, he was out of the relationship, but he couldn't get her out of his mind. He was passing through a certain life stage. He presented himself as always feeling that he was a man of infinite promise. But the fact is, he was reaching midlife, and he wasn't going to be on an eternal ascent from that point on. In a sense, that love obsession was shielding himself from that. I have seen a great many patients for whom that kind of obsession persists and persists and persists. Try and think, what's the meaning of the obsession? It's very important to understand what's the meaning of the symptom. Death terror seems to defy our scientific views on things or anything that we can reason through. It seems so obvious to me the consciousness is a function of mind and the activity of our brains. And when the brain ceases to function, our mind ceases to function. It feels like a wonderful thing if we think of a heaven or an afterlife in which all our desires will be met in perpetuity. But to me, it's a fairy tale. Wishing doesn't make it so. You look back on your life and uh, what regrets do you have for the way that you've lived so far? If you have a feeling that you've done what you wanted to do in life, I think the idea of death comes much more easily for you.
Schopenhauer had a comment that I always liked very much. He compared his various tyrannical drives, especially for him, a very powerful sexual drive. He compared it to the sun. And, uh, but then he says, as these drives began to weaken and get less and less and less, and the sun got dimmer and dimmer, and finally faded away, suddenly he could see the night stars and the night sky, and he saw all these wonders in the sky that he'd never really seen before, So because he was always diverted by the tyrannous compulsions they had. So that's another nice metaphor to think. Some of these other things begin to die away and see all these wonders of life that you hadn't really noticed before. So right now, I'm enjoying the night sky. So, Dr. Yavum, uh, you have many readers from our country, from different professions, uh, but uh, mostly, I believe you have from the students of psychology. I would like to ask uh, for um, advice uh, for those who study psychology and who want to become a psychotherapist. Uh, so, advice on how to be a good therapist. Well, um, how to be a good therapist? Well, I think one, yeah. of, the, one, one of the important uh, things is that to be a good therapist, you really have to, uh, have to, have to understand yourself. And, yeah. uh, and I think being in psychotherapy is very important for therapists. Uh, so I urge all people who are uh, going to be therapists to, to understand themselves as, as best they possibly can. Uh, so I, I urge every patient, every, every psychotherapist I see to, to, uh, to get, understand yourself, to be in uh, individual therapy. And also I think it's important for, for therapists to, uh, to be in group therapy. Uh, I've been in a psychotherapy group with, with other therapists for the last 25 years. We meet an hour and a half or every other week, and uh, it's about eight or nine people in them, all of them therapists. I'm not the leader of the group. It's a leaderless group. So I think that's a very important issue. You have to understand yourself uh, very much because you are your major tool. Uh, you, you're like medication. You know, you need to understand it, it very, very much. So. I, I, there are many things I can talk about in, in the training of therapists, but that's that's one thing that I really want to say is absolutely paramount for me. Yeah. When I when I started my training in psycho in psychiatry, I, I started a, a psychoanalysis, and I met four times a week with the therapist. But since then, I, I've, I've whenever I'm feeling uncomfortable or not feeling well or not not feeling well about myself, I'll go see a therapist and see, have a few sessions or maybe meet for a year or so. And I urge all my other fellow therapists to do the same. Yeah. Uh, and I think being alone as a therapist and not being together with other therapists or, or meeting regularly with other therapists is a mistake. You need to have some colleagueship in the field with whom you can talk about things openly uh, they can be just colleagues. Uh, sometimes it's useful to have an elder supervisor who can work with you too. So all those are important things for, for a therapist. So, so my another question is, so, uh, what are the musts and don'ts for a psychotherapist? Well, I, I think as a therapist, you, you need to be empathic. You need to know how the patient feels. Uh, you try to be uh, gentle and helpful with the therapist. I tend to be fairly open and disclosing about myself to the ther to the patient. Uh, I tend to, uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, there was an American psychologist named Carl Rogers. He's very well known in America. But he, he said there, there are three very important things that a therapist must, must do. And one of them is, is uh, uh, accurate empathy. We just talked about that. Yeah. And, and another one is genuineness, to be a real person uh, to the, to the, with the patient, to be open and genuine with the person. And the third one is, is to, to, to be uh, non-conditional, uh, approval of the patient. You want, to, you want to approve the patient, do what you can to be kind and gentle with the patient. So I think those three things have said it very well. I, I don't think things have changed very much. Where, where Carl Rogers' ideas of how you are with a patient are, are any different. 
Uh, so uh, you you have your one preferred uh, approach, or you go from a mixed way. So you have guest out or psychoanalysis, or you just have your own way. Well, yeah, yes. Well, it's not my own way. I mean, I practice the way a lot of psychiatrists and a lot of psychotherapists do, uh, where uh, I tend to be, uh, 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 I meet with them, I tend to be open with them, uh, I, and uh, I invite them to tell me about the things that are troubling them, and I try to contribute in any way that I can. Thank you, Dr. Yellen. Uh, I would like to end this conversation with a special thanks from the staff of uh, Sika Journal and uh, we really appreciate uh, your sharing time with us and uh, thank you so much. I'm very sorry that we've had so much uh, trouble with the transmission here but, but uh, no, 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 I hope, hope my comments and my books are useful to your audience. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Hmm.